It's very difficult for China to face any kind of economic difficulty without admitting that the Communist Party of China and its leaders enjoy this divine authority of heaven. Um, this, they, they are the inheritors of the empire. So to say you're wrong in China, especially at the top, is very difficult. It presents enormous moral uh, problems. The picture you, you painted at the start then of a China that sort of underestimated and rather disregarded Britain, that's obviously turned on its head after the opium, after the opium wars. Would you say it is sort of turned back on its head now that China, did, I mean, how does, how does China regard Britain today? Does China regard, look back on this history with, a, with, with any resentment over it, with a sense of malice over it, or is it, is it just disregarded? Uh, well, China's history has had a deep effect. It's burnt deep into the Chinese soul. The present-day Chinese speak of the era of humiliation in which China bowed to the will of foreigners, Was uh, Chinese were treated arrogantly, cruelly at times by foreigners, and forced to sign what the Chinese now call unequal treaties. And moreover, bits of China were chopped off, incidentally, Tibet, Taiwan, uh, Manchuria, all these places that the, the foreigner was was going to take China's lands. Britain didn't want lands, but the Russians and Japanese did. So today's Chinese look back as a time of humiliation. And of course, the situation has turned up on its head because China is now a global superpower with extraordinary uh, military and naval reach. Um, it is government, the Chinese government is bent on restoring the lost territories, Hong Kong, uh, Tibet, and now its eyes are on Taiwan. So China is now a global superpower. Uh, it, it, it is uh, like Britain in the 19th century, sees itself as dominating the world and is very keen to get its own way. T turning specifically to Hong Kong, why did China put up with Britain being there for so long, do you think? Um, it was useful. It was useful to the Chinese emperors and to the Chinese Communist Party, because it was an entrepot, um, a port through which uh, exports and imports could flow. It was a basis for banking and investment. And it was, if you like, China's um, uh, sort of doorway to the world. And this was appreciated. And so the Chinese tolerated it. Uh, in 1949, uh, Chao Anlai, the communist virtually foreign secretary says, we will permit you to stay because we, you are useful to us. And this message was repeated throughout the Maoist era and really until the 1980s. And should we be surprised at the sort of the, what appears to be a, a rapid erosion of autonomy in, in Hong Kong since the Chinese takeover? Uh, you know, then, there were suggestions beforehand that China would move, move a, lot, a, a lot more slowly, whereas that doesn't seem to have happened at all. Well, not really, because uh, colonial imperial Hong Kong was a crown colony. And, and unlike the other crown colonies, in 1945, um, the Labour government decided that we were not going to allow Hong Kong to progress towards democracy and independence, simply because the uh, port and the city were full of communist agitators. And so after the war, Kong, Hong Kong was ruled with quite a tight ship. Um, there were no plans or preparations to have representative assemblies, as there might have been in, say, Jamaica or Nigeria. Uh, the British were fairly tolerant rulers. Um, they had occasional clashes, cultural clashes. There were great rows about the Chinese eating dogs. Uh, but in the end, the the colonial government said, although the English find this reprehensible, uh, we'll allow it to continue because it's a Chinese custom. Hmm. And how how should Britain relate today to China? Is it worth our while mentioning our history, talking up our history, or should we be sort of trying to pretend it didn't happen because China doesn't appreciate it? Well, I think we should remember uh, what China's history was, um, its periods of humiliation, uh, invasion, um, uh, British invaded twice in 18, during the Opium Wars and again in 1860. And the, this, these, this submission uh, was a reminder to Chinese that they were a great civilization which had uh, passed into eclipse. 
And now they realize that they are a global superpower, just like Britain was then, that they have authority, they have global reach, and they expect respect, and they don't wish to be criticized, and they are not going to be bullied or pushed around. Mm. So there's a sense of this resentment, which is uh, translated into a very fierce and determined sense of independence and an equally fierce sense of their own power in the world. And turning explicitly to Taiwan, would you say some conflict between China and the West over Taiwan is inevitable at this point, or, or, or could things rumble on as they are really indefinitely? Yeah, it's very hard to answer. No, nothing's really inevitable until after it's happened. And the Chinese <laughs> have repeatedly said that they will somehow undertake a vast amphibious and aerial invasion of Taiwan at some date. This has been repeated by the leadership for the last 30 or 40 years. But um, there is, comes the matter of action. I mean, Taiwan has no allies. Britain, neither Britain or America have an alliance with Taiwan. And although America has been its patron very roughly since 1949. So for the Chinese, Taiwan is an integral part of China. And the fact that it remains in foreign hands, well, not foreign hands, for 50 years it was occupied by the Japanese, but the fact that it is detached is a reminder of past humility, past mm. China being a country to which things happened, rather than now it's a country which makes things happen. And look, uh, before I let you go, look, Beijing's economic model has has hit problems of late. The, the Chinese economy is not in the root health it was a few years ago. Uh, is there any suggestion or indeed belief within China that perhaps, you know, the, the, the idea, this idea of China being the coming world superpower might have hit a bit of, bump in, a bit of a bump in the road and, and, and might not happen? Uh, it's the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party um, and its leaders, um, believe, as a great number of Chinese people do, that somehow they possess the mandate of heaven. The old Chinese emperors believed that they ruled by the will of heaven, and they were the agents of a divine authority and expected total submission. Well, present economic circumstances uh, means that they are, as you say, in some trouble. But this creates an enormous problem because do does a government which believes it has this almost supernatural divine power above it have to admit it's wrong? And if it does so, mm. it forfeits its power. So it's very difficult for China to face any kind of economic difficulty without admitting that the Communist Party of China and its leaders enjoy this divine authority of heaven. Um, this, they, they are the inheritors of the empire. So to say you're wrong in China, especially at the top, is very difficult. It presents enormous moral uh, problems.